Hello and welcome to The Bottom Line. I'm here again with Dr. Greg Reed. We have been discussing some fascinating subjects, a lot of it concerning the occult. But one of the things I'm learning about Dr. Greg is how he has investigated the, the, the issues of the occult, Luciferianism, and so on over so many years, and, and just how it pervades society, and how it relates to the end times and the rise of the Antichrist and all kinds of things. So we're going to explore this a little more. Now, if you did see the last program, we were talking about something that he called the big boys. So I'm going to go back to that just for a moment as a refresher, and then we'll start looking into some of the other things that are, um, work, uh, relate to the work that he has done. So, Greg... We referred to the big boys, and I know you touched on it in the last program, but can you just pick that up again? What do we mean by the big boys, just in case the viewers missed that? Well, I think when we've heard a term recently about the deep state. Yes, yes. The swamp. Yes. That's very real. And there's a lot of good people in a lot of agencies, but there's an underbelly of, of people, the big boys, that are doing uh, ungodly things for supposedly for national purposes and, once, and for the good of the people for the good of, of the people yeah. Yeah. yeah and once we started to come across that it just became a whole different deal and it actually started when i was looking uh into an investigation of a child that was kidnapped way back in the i think in the early 80s he's a 12 year old schoolboy johnny gosh and he was just kidnapped off just disappeared and then all those years later i found out that there was a guy who was actually investigating that as Senator John DeCamp uh, from Nebraska, and that they had actually uncovered a nest of pedophile trading groups that was so extensive and had people in so many areas. Uh, they actually, the main ringleader, and this is not Democrat or Republican, I'm just giving you facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. The main ringleader for this particular group was uh, saying at the, both the 1984 and the 1988 uh, Republican National Conventions. At the same time, he was flying in private planes of children and young teenagers for sexual activities with the senators and congressmen and the powerful bankers and all that My goodness. after hours. It was an extensive case. Uh, the book was called um, The Franklin Cover-Up. It's one of the toughest books I have ever read, but it really gives up the store. You see how extensive it was. Nearly everybody who was involved in that case is now gone. Mm. Some under some very, very questionable circumstances. Wow. So we began to look into how deep and wide this went. And the more you talk, the more people talk. Right. And any time I did law enforcement classes, probation classes, school presentations, somebody would come up to me and say, you probably need to know about this or you probably need to know about that. And we started to be able to uncover and get the authorities on active pedophiles. We did that within this community where there was somebody that had been uh, molesting kids for, I don't know, 15 years and gotten away with it. This community being in El Paso? Yeah, in El Paso. Right. Yeah, and it was um, a lot of kids were damaged. So that became a whole other area where we started to see pedophilia, of course, in Hollywood is well known. It's been there I have great um, uh, admiration for uh, Corey Feldman, uh, the young actor from the 80s who uh, is trying to really just expose all of this and what happened to him and his best friend Corey Haim and the whole circle of people who were involved, producers and directors. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's two levels of this. One is Pedophiles that molest kids mm -hmm. and make sure the kids don't talk. Right. And they generally don't unless they're given permission. There's that level, but then there's the other, the more organized, which we call human trafficking. Yes. Uh, we used to call it child trading back in the day. Uh, I was mentored by a captain from a police department who allowed me to go through his very difficult training on all this. And he actually looked at the case I was working on from here. And he told me, even at that time, this is back in 1990, 
he said that even back then, the child trading and child pornography was a $35 billion a year industry. I mean, that's the, it's the, in the 90s. That's in the 90s. Yeah. You can imagine how through the roof that is now. Yeah. Now, here's the difficulty we're running across, because I'm thankful people are talking about it. And I'm not trying to be critical, but people in general, and Christians specifically, kind of have a short attention span right. on these things. Right, right, yes. So I was concerned that when people start talking about this, this would be the issue du jour. You know, this would be the next topic to be excited about or upset about, try and support, and I'm glad, because ministries came up out of this that were specifically helping the victims out. All that's good. But what we don't understand is 95% of the attention on human trafficking has gone to young women who have been taken from other countries or from our country, compromised in some way, addicted to drugs, and put into prostitution. Mm. It's a horrible, horrible thing that should never happen for any reason. No, no. And I'm so grateful for the ministries that are extracting these young ladies out of this. Here's the hard truth. In the real world of child trading, those girls are considered collateral damage. Mm. They're considered an acceptable business loss as long as we don't find out what's going on at the higher levels. Yes, yes. Because when you really get there, you understand there's a ring that goes all the way through this country. We've got mapped out most of the cities where they will go into a small city like, let's just give up the store. We might as well. Let's go into a small town like Truth of Consequences, New Mexico. Nobody's heard of it. Nobody goes there except to get gas and get out of town. Right filled with drug abuse and meth and child abuse and so easy to go into a place like that where either the authorities are on the payroll of bad people or they're just looking the other way and they can see a desperate couple who's strung out on meth who has a bunch of annoying children they don't know what to do and they'll sell their kid for a hit of meth or for a couple hundred dollars. And you know what I find fascinating Greg is that this is not guesswork. You have investigated this for years. I was interested that you mentioned the 80s uh, because in the 80s when I was uh, training law enforcement in, in child protection, I remember having lunch in the, in the police training center one day and the guy sitting opposite me said, what do you do? And I told him, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm an FBI agent. I've come here for training. And he said, um, we just busted the big, biggest pedophile ring in the world. That was in the 80s. And I said, like, well, well, who are they? And he's talking judges, politicians, solicitors, you know, not just ordinary people on the street, but these are people with positions in, in life. And, and you were talking just now about the size of the problem. I, I made some notes in preparation for this, if I, if I might just read them, and then I'd like to come back to some of those things that you were saying. In terms of uh, pedophilia, I uh, was doing a bit of research. It said the United States Justice Department, uh, and, and they may underestimate, I don't know, and it may be about cases they do know, but the United States Justice Department estimates that some 300,000 youth are at risk of becoming, um, uh, 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 being part of commercial exploitation. Two-thirds, they say, uh, uh, of this research, two-thirds of the sex offenders in, the, in state prisons committed offences against children and more than 747,000 registered sex offenders are in the United States. But as many as 100,000 of them are non-compliant or missing. Um, and then in terms of human trafficking, it says it wasn't made legal, illegal in the United States until the year 2000, which I found very surprising. And uh, there's a report from the Blue Campaign which says every year millions of men, women, and children are trafficked worldwide, including right here in the U.S., the global profits of which are $150 billion a year, $99 billion from commercial sexual exploitation, and hundreds of thousands of victims are in the U.S.A., and your casework, uh, Greg, over 30 years, and, and I'm, I'm listening with great interest to the levels at which you are citing, is just incredible. I mean, this is last, we're in the last of the last days here. 
And people are, are we're talking about the highest levels Absolutely. being involved. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about some of your casework, some of the things you've investigated? I think the church and, and, and Christians need to know how serious and how bad things are. They can't bury their head in the sand. And, and I don't think the church overall, uh, based on my own experience, is equipped to deal with these victims when they come knocking on the door of the church saying, I need help. And that's the hard part because this is very difficult for people to accept this is happening. Part of it because they have kids. It's like, I don't want to talk about this. But that's why we have to talk about it because their kids are at risk. Uh, one of the more discouraging things or things we had to work through is when this thing hits the church world, when there's a case uh, of any kind, but it's particularly a high-level case, where someone in, in leadership is abusing children, I found that the, the, the first response is to circle the wagons and to protect the abuser. Yes. And I to can throw, throw the victim to the wind. Right. You know, there was a huge case. It's still ongoing. One of these days, this person's going to come to justice that had operated 30 years in this town, abused numerous kids, continuing to do that to this day. My gosh. But everybody was turning a blind eye, didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to talk. He was a man of God. We didn't want to, you know, touch God's anointing. You know, whatever we do there... And that's how he continued to get away with it, is everybody was afraid to say, look, we're responsible for this. You know, I had one person say, what do you want me to do about it? I said, I want you to act because you're responsible for protecting the innocent. Jesus was very clear yeah. about anybody who defends one of these little ones is better than a millstone, be tied around their right. neck and be cast into the, the sea. So, you know, when you come across that, and we came across one where, it's a leader of a national children's ministry, well-respected, still in operation, and it's hard for me to be sitting on a case file where he went to court with his ex-wife on the abuse of his own son. Mm. So, you know, that's the kind of... So the, the, the key is, is we have to have people talk. Yes. They have to have a safe place to talk. Yes. They have to be able to... Because it's already terribly painful... And I learned, and you may have yourself in dealing with the system, the court system is not necessarily our friend. And here's Very another true. thing. Very and, true. And we may get into some dangerous territory some down, time down the road and talk about a secret club that a lot of these judicial people are involved in that make sure things operate according to their will and purpose, mm -hmm. regardless of what's true or not. But when we get the kids into the court system, it was brutal, it was awful, and, and who wants to do that? And when you watch your own children who have been abused, be abused by the defense lawyer on yes. the stand yes. and humiliated, had so many parents along the way said, we want justice, but we need to save our lives, we need to save our child's life. We can't put them through that. So the odds are against the victim. Always. Always. Always, yes. yes. And so the support system for them needs to be so strong. I wrote a book called The Color of Pain, which was about, first half was about what abusers do, yep. how they operate, how they find their victims. The other half was from a personal perspective, this is how it changes your life. And we've tried to put that in the hands of every single child we know that's going to go into the court system. Right. Because they need to know they're not alone in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you're right about the the... the <laughs> The defense lawyers, I mean, they, they're like lions. They, they'll come at you and tear you apart. Mm -hmm. And for a child to have to go through that, that's very traumatic. Um, it, it, and this whole business of, of, you know, we talked earlier about the, the, the people in, high, in the high echelons of society, but you've also just indicated it's happening in the church too. And uh, I met a guy some years ago who was a bishop in the UK, in the, in the Anglican church. Very well respected man, was a close friend of royalty. He is now in prison because they have discussed, discovered that he was involved in child sexual abuse. And you're right, the first thing that it seems to happen is, you know, circle the wagons, let's, let's make sure 
um, that this man or woman, whoever it happens to be, is protected, and, and the poor child gets left out in the cold. Uh, and, and because of that, generally, doesn't get the right treatment either oh, yeah. and, and has to grow up with this, you know, this very damaging experience. It, I remember... Um, no, no, I don't want to get right off the subject because I think it is is kind of associated. But I remember being in a in a pastor's conference one one time, and and, and this pastor talked to, about and he gave st statistics. I wish I'd wrote them down. How when there is a Christian conference in a hotel setting, that the statistics of people viewing pornography on television in the hotel goes way up when there's a Christian conference. So it's associated in, in a sense, I suppose, because it's all about, you know, pornography, sex and, and, and stuff like that. Um, it's a growing problem, I think, you know, it is. in the last days. Yeah. You will have found that out because of your, your casework. And, uh, you know, the, the pornography thing is, is so much a part of this. Many people don't realize this, but child pornography was on the streets legal in Hollywood in 1970. You could buy it on the street corner. Wow. It wasn't banned until several years after that. So it's been there for a long time. And you have this, this group of people who are pedophiles, who are politically active. Uh, they want a group called NAMBLA, which is the National American Boy, Man Boy Love Association. And another one called... Rene Guyon Society. Can you repeat that? Yeah, NAMBLA, National American Man Boy Love Association. Now, I, I, I don't know how many people are listening to this. You may never have heard of this before. But I'm going to ask Greg if he will just repeat that one more time in case you're living in a cosseted environment. Greg, repeat yes. that, please. Actually, I might have got the name. It's North American Man Boy Love Association. My goodness. Yeah, and they've been lobbying for the lowering of the age of consent for right. years, and they've worked with, in partnership with uh, some people out of Denmark or, or, or uh, Holland. Holland, yeah. To to change this, Holland has a, a magazine called Pydeca that's produced from the pedophile community. I've heard of that. Now, you see the larger picture. The group, what's called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, yes. whose sole purpose is to tell people the kids lie. And we lost a lot of cases because of them. One of their top experts on that was a man who was actually quoted in the Pydeca magazine saying that pedophiles just need to accept that theirs is a God-given thing and that I, they can lovingly express love through their condition. And this was a guy that was on the board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. So these people are all kind of working together. So but the pornography issue, both of, there was a time when if somebody wanted to do pornography with children, that you had to have a, a, just a camera, and then there came the video camera, but you had to find a way to get the film produced, uh, to, to get it developed and all that. The Internet was like opened up the gates of hell. Yeah. David Wilkerson, 1973, had a vision from God. And one of the things he said is God showed me uh, out of the book of Nahum. It says, I will pour upon you abominable filth. And he said, there is going to be a glut of filth and pornography that's going to reach across the world. Wow, that's and, prophetic. And it was prophetic. And I actually had a dream. I rarely talk about it, but it was in the 70s before, or late, like mid-80s before the Internet really became a mm -hmm. thing. And I had a dream about David Wilkerson's before he passed away. And he said, son, I want to show you something. And we went into a room, and he put a reel of, of video on, and he showed a video, just the first part, of babies being raped. Mm. And then in the dream, he just lost his mind and just slammed the camera down and was screaming and crying. I woke up, I thought, what in the world now? And I, this is so hard to talk about, and I have to apologize to folks out there that this is new to them. But the rape of infants is one of the biggest trends on the Internet right now. And I think how much, so what I saw in the dream was what was going to happen. How much more before God just takes and judges everything? These little babies, they don't even have the ability to process anything. Their memory isn't informed. So you're going to have full-grown adults 
who are going to be in total trauma all the time, abusing drugs, ruining their lives because they're in pain, but they don't know where the pain came from. Who can heal that? Yeah. My God can heal that, yeah. but nobody else can heal yeah. that kind of pain. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Greg, I, I, I don't think we should apologize to, to the viewers for, for the, the content that we're discussing right now. This is a wake-up call. You have to know, as Christians, you can't just go to church and have a nice time of worship and listen to a good three-point sermon and go and tell the pastor at the end of it, I loved your sermon, and then go home and have your Sunday dinner or whatever it happens to be. This is the real McCoy. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is going on in your city. Wherever this is going to be seen, Wherever in the world that this is going to be seen, I'm telling you, this is going on in your city. It is going on in your city. When I was doing child protection work, I had cases where babies were sexually abused by their fathers. And we're talking about serious sexual abuse. And I will tell you this, I know that there are people watching this who themselves have been sexually abused and never said a word to anybody through fear, through whatever reasons, you have never said a word to anybody and you've been carrying that pain all, you, all these years. Listen, God wants to meet you at the point of your need. Jesus can heal you from that, that trauma, those bad memories. So please don't hold it back. Get in touch with somebody. Get in touch with us and, and let us try and point you in the right direction and, and give you some help. And Greg, it's interesting that you say that how, how prolific that particular aspect of, uh, of sexual abuse is growing. Um, and obviously the internet has, has, has done a lot of damage in that area because it just made it so easy. Uh, and we haven't even talked about things like snuff movies and all that kind of stuff yet, but we know all these things are going on. So has your casework also taken you into the area of infant abuse as well? Yes, I mean, we made the discovery that this was being produced and, and distributed, and we actually have run across a group that was out of another state that part of what they did was uh, child snuff movies where they abused and then killed the child. Yes. Now, we were really locking horns with the federal agencies at some point. They're saying, no, there's no such thing as snuff films. I'm like, you know, would you guys just plug in your computers yeah. and look around because we're 10 years ahead of you here. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, I mean, it, it's, and, and here's the thing. We're in probably the second generation now of porn viewing by younger people. And I think all of that kind of has lessened all the, just ruined every kind of sexuality. Anything goes. Anything goes. Anything. Uh, Canada's legalized bestiality. Yes. Uh, we're, we're not far behind on all that. But, you know, with all of that happening, what's happening is the, these pedophile groups like NAMBLA have taken their cues from the political arena, particularly the LGBTQ political, uh, I don't know what to call it, strategy. Mm -hmm. And they're now pushing that to legalize pedophilia, to lower the age of consent, what shocked me, and I was utterly unprepared for, is the ones that are pushing for that are kids. They're the ones that are posting memes saying, who are you to tell me I can't have adult sex with an adult if I want? Really? And so we're not prepared to, to deal with that. There's a whole generation of kids that have been so twisted by the Internet and by pornography that that's normal to them. So the Internet is doing all the work for these pedophile groups, and it's just opened up the gates of hell. And uh, so I'm a big believer we need to train parents how to help their kids. We need to train parents on how these pedophiles work, how to protect their kids, what to look out for, how to report when something happens, all of that. And you're right. It does happen everywhere. I know this happens here. I know it happens in other cities, but we've tracked at least three groups that have gone around the city in SUVs with little children, mm. sending them into restaurants. So folks, if this happens, know this is what's going on. You see children coming into restaurants, they have cups or they have candy and say, can you help support school, my school, my sports team. Don't just buy something, ask the question, what school, 
do you go to? If they can't answer, they're being trafficked. And this is happening in El Paso. Yes, it is. And we, tra we, we tracked one and followed them for nearly 45 minutes as they had three kids in the car and would take them to Target, Marshalls. Uh, all. We called 911 three times, get the police out, get the police out, get the police out. Then nobody ever came out. My goodness. And I finally talked to a friend of mine in ICE. I said, what is going on here? He says, well, the reality is, is they're probably not going to come out without a lot of phone calls, but they realize they'll, they can arrest these pimps and they'll be back on the streets the next day because they've got these high-powered lawyers. So it's working against us. But I think if, if enough of us recognize, when you see that happening, dial 911, report it. If they get enough phone calls, maybe they'll actually start doing mm, something about it. Right. So really what, 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 uh, or something that needs to be done, Greg, is there needs to be uh, uh, given, uh, training given to, to pastors in churches because victims are going to be coming in with all kinds of trauma. Um, they, we need uh, training, further training for the police, and you've done a lot of that already, uh, and maybe training for, uh, I'm going to say this tongue-in-cheek, but some government officials. <laughs> but then again, we know that there's some who are involved one mm -hmm. way or another. Um, and training for parents, of course. Um, it, it is really quite a disturbing um, area, really, when you think about it, that, that, that this is what we're, this is, these are the days we're living in. We're just about to close. Um, let me just say this to you, that if you, if you are uh, or have been, are or have been a victim of any form of abuse or human trafficking, and you're looking for a healing, you're looking for a way out, please get in touch with us. We can put you in touch with Dr. Greg and his ministry, and we can help you. So please do that. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you.